Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We continue with our study in the book of 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 4 still. And we'll pick up here again. We're going to read, oh, we'll start in about verse 4 here, I guess, and read down to where we're at. It says, For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. These things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? As if thou hadst not received it. Now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings, Without us, and I would to God you did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles last, as it were, appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to the angels, and to men. As Paul continues to speak to us here, God speaking, into, uh, speaking to us in and through Paul, we consider his words, and we're, we're in verse 6 here last time. Again here where he says, In these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for, uh, for one against another. My friends, we have in the world not just religious leaders, but we have religious leaders, religious men, and we have political leaders. And whether it be those that are of religion or those who are of politics, and they all do mingle somewhat. You cannot live in this life without having understanding of both and seeing a responsibility to consider both. Whether it be men of religion and of faith that come nigh unto you and speak the things of God, and you ought to take heed and consider their words, and to try them by the word of God, and by political leaders who would lead our nations. And we ought to judge them by friends, by the word of God. For most of them do in some way or some part use God's word to justify their actions and their deeds which they set into, to into motion. And by the word of God, we can judge whether or not they be just or unjust, good or evil. And we ought to. We who are spiritually minded ought to judge these things, even as he speaks of reigning. We have a responsibility in and through the word of God to discern the things that are going on around about us, whether or not they be of God. And these that would come nigh unto us and speak unto us, whether it be the things of God or the things of the world, if we know God, if we know the Lord and a free pardon and forgiveness of sin, and we truly are blessed. And we ought not take that for granted. But we ought to praise God for it, who has saved us by His grace through faith in His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and that not of works, lest we should boast. There's no works involved in that. And that grace, which does come specifically just in and through Jesus Christ, that grace of God and through the faith of God is in His Son, not through anything else, not through baptism, not through the Lord's Supper, not through going and confessing your sins, not through this or that, but only in and through the faith of God which is in His Son. Our salvation is in the Lord, and our faith is in that salvation which He declares unto us that because we believe, we do have eternal, everlasting life. 
and is not something that we've had to work for, nor is it something we have to work to keep. But if you have it, if you have salvation, you're going to do good works. You're going to have works that show forth the change of God in your life, whereas you live for self and you live for the world, you've now repented, you've now turned from your sins, you're now a professing believer, you're born again, and you're doing those things which according to the counsel of God that you might be able to reach others in the name of the Lord. And as those, as it were, Paul and Paulus, and in those days or in our days, whether it be me or some other brethren who come nigh unto you and witness unto you of the things of God, we are all going to be tried by the word of God. And some are going to be found to be false brethren. False preachers and teachers, and those of Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist who deny the relationship of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Beware of such that deny these things. Now, my friends, why do we have a knowledge and understanding that others don't? Ask yourself that. Why do you have a knowledge and understanding that others don't? Why do you know something about this or that and others don't? Because it is God, my friends, who makes you to differ. It is God who caused your parents to come together at a certain place and time and to fall in love and to have a relationship that led to your existence. You're not just something that's a piece of flesh that all of a sudden found itself to be alive and began to have thought and began to rise up out of the bucket of mire and say, Hey, look at me. I'm a living being. I evolved and come into existence. No, that's man's wicked ways of thinking. To deny God and to want us to believe that after millions upon millions of years, we just happen to come into existence in the midst of all the other life that's in this world. I want to end with the foolish idea that we all came from the same line of, line of things. That it started with one little life form, and it went out and evolved, and it mutated in all these different things of not just human beings, not just the birds in the air, not just the fish, not just the, plant, the living animals on the land, but even the trees and the plants and the grass. We all had the same origin. What utter foolishness. Well, they call it science. But I say to you it's utter, utter foolishness to want us to believe that this advanced, complicated ecosystem which we live, live in, to where that man <coughs> breathes in oxygen, and how do we have oxygen? We have plants that produce oxygen. And how do they live and produce oxygen? Because they live on CO2. We breathe out CO2. So we are or carbon dioxide. So man and the plants are dependent on one another to live. And so are all the living animals that, uh, that live on oxygen, that breathe out carbon dioxide. The living animals are dependent upon all the plants and trees and grass. There are all kinds of symbiotic relationships between the things in this world. Where one thing depends upon something else for it to live. And vice versa. And my friends, it's utter foolishness to believe that all that, all that just slowly came into existence. That it evolved from nothing and here it is. It's utter foolishness. And for one of them then to stand and say, oh, because that man over there claims to be a scientist and he wants to believe God did it, he's not a scientist. Oh, if you don't come to the same conclusion I do, you're not a scientist. Well, that's just the same as me standing up and saying, well, if you don't believe exactly what I believe about the Word of God, you're not a Christian. And that would be utter foolishness. God has given unto us what we have physically and mentally spiritually, the knowledge which we have, God has allowed, it to, allowed us to have it. And there is a vast array of knowledge before us in this life that we can apply ourselves to and learn. The thing is, we all know this, that we can read and look over things, and some things we retain and some things we don't. I've read a lot of books throughout the years of my life. A lot of it's just gone. 
but the things that are important, I think they're still there. Why is that? Why do I still know how to put something together in construction? Why do I still know how that the basic things of life work? Why do I still have the knowledge and understand the things of God? Because God gives it unto us and allows us to retain it. And there are others who are cursed, in a sense, and blessed, in a sense, also. To where they, everything they read and see is always there, just, just like flipping a page in their head. They can see it, call it back. And the same is true for all the things they wish they didn't, uh, could have never seen. It's still there in their head. And at times, my friends, there's still that garbage there in our head. The things we looked on in our sinful life and beheld, which will come back to memory, come to the forethoughts of our mind. Perhaps it's trauma, perhaps it's something wicked. And we wish we could just forget about it forever and it never come back, but yet it's still there. It's Satan bringing it to our remembrance to remind us of how we failed God. It is God, though, that caused us to be brought from that state of being lost and undone into a state of trusting and believing in Him for our salvation. It is God who has made us to differ. It is God that has saved us by His grace. He could have left us lost and undone without God or His Son. But my friends, He reached way down for you. He reached way down for me. And He saved us by His grace. He saved us by His power. Not by my will, not by my desire, not by my efforts, not by my works. I'm not kept by my own power, by my own thoughts, by my own will, but I'm kept by the power of God. And He'll finish the work which He's started in me. And He will in you as well. If you know the Lord as your Redeemer, as your Savior, as your Justifier, as that one who makes you holy in Him, He is who has made you to differ above others. And we find that we have a greater responsibility because of that. We have a responsibility then that we would be the example unto others to not to lift ourselves up before them, but also look at my life and follow my example. No, look to the Lord and see Him even as I have seen Him. Look to the Lord for your salvation. Look to the Lord for your redemption. Don't look to me. I can't save you. I couldn't save myself. God had to do it. And you can't save your loved ones. God has to do it. And you have to turn them over to the Lord. You have to say, Lord, and you, and you do it every day. You lift them up before the Lord in prayer. Say, Lord, have mercy upon these. Save them from their sins. Cause them to see Jesus and to trust in Him. He's the one that can and will and does do it. He's the one that saves people every day. Cause them to see themselves lost and undone without God or His Son. And He saves them by His grace and mercy. He is the one who makes them to differ, who changes them from being a lost, undone, wicked person, a transgressor, a sinner. And He saves them and He makes them a child of God, born again, able to believe upon Him who died for them. There on that cross he suffered and died and shed his blood. And there it was finished, my friends. Once for us. Once he died. And that's all that was necessary to redeem us from all our sins. My friends, there are some of the so-called Christian religions out here that lift up a Jesus before you. And I say, oh, he couldn't save you from all your sins. They all say, well, from that very moment you believed... In your life, everything from their back's covered and taken care of. But from that moment on, anything else you got to work off. From that moment on, you got to do something to redeem yourself from those things. My friends, that's heresy. That's a lie. It's not just the sins from the moment you're saved back. But it's the sins from that moment back and that moment forward, every one of them. He suffered and died for on the cross of Calvary. He paid for every one of the sins of your life. Or he did not pay for any of them. 
And if you don't understand that, you don't understand the scriptures. For the many, for the many, he declared, for the many I have come to save them from their sins. And he did indeed do that. He paid their sin debt on the cross of Calvary. All those before that day that looked to him by faith, those in the Old Testament times that didn't know the name Jesus, but they knew the Lord. They knew that one that was lifted up before them, the I Am. They knew God who said, I'm going to send a Redeemer. And by faith they saw it coming afar off. They knew it would come. And that faith was kind to them for righteousness. And to those in Christ's day who saw his ministry, they saw his walk of life, and they saw him crucified. And then they saw him risen from the grave. And they knew that their Savior had come. Well, I want to say to you, the apostles already knew. They said, we've found the one for whom we've looked for. Before he ever went to the cross, they knew they found him. Oh, yes, they had their moments of doubt. Simon Peter certainly did. He denied him thrice. Even though he did truly believe he was the Savior. Yet he had doubts. Is he really him? Is, that, is this really going to be it? Why does he have to die? He had to die to redeem us from all our sins. And my friends, people get puffed up. People got puffed up and they wanted to blame the Jews for killing him. Wanted to blame early Christians for letting it happen. It had to be done to redeem us from all our sins, to make us to differ from others who were yet lost and still yet lost in their sins. He's made us to be different. He's made us to differ because we were lost and undone in the muck and mire of our sins, and God lifted us up out of that and revealed unto us His Son who suffered and died in our place. He gave us the gift of faith to believe upon Him who is our kinsman redeemer, the firstborn among many brethren. And my friends, we've been adopted into the family of God. He's made us to differ. In this life, people who have children, legally they can disown their children if they want to. You have the legal right, you can disown your children. You can just write them out of your will and legally, legally can be done. Your natural children. But those children that you adopt into your family, you cannot, you can't disown them. You can't get rid of them. They're yours. Legally, they're bound to you by law, and they are yours because you've adopted them. And this is true for us. We who have been, we've been adopted by the grace of God, and He cannot cast us aside because the law demands it. The law demands He keep us. He has redeemed us. He's bought us with a price. We're not our own. We're the Lord's. He is the one who has made us to differ. And these things we ought to strive to understand. For we're puffed up within ourselves if we don't. We want to push aside and say, No, I refuse to accept that. Or you're puffed up. You're puffed up and you refuse to acknowledge the sovereign grace of God in your life. You want to exalt yourself above a certain level and say, Oh, I've done this to get that salvation. I went up and knelt, back, knelt, <clears throat> I went up and knelt down at a prayer altar and I received Jesus. I did this and I received Jesus. I got my salvation. No, no you didn't. It was given unto you by the grace of God. God made you and I to differ. And there's still those that are lost and undone without God or His Son. And unless God reaches down and saves them, they'll stay that way. It's not left in their hands. Yes, we must live before them and set before them the gospel of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. They must hear of Him first. How can they call upon him in whom they have not heard of? How can they hear if you do not preach it before them, if you do not say it before them, that they might see it in you? And by that they're convicted, they're condemned, because they have not received your witness, 
and those who do not receive your witness do not receive the witness of God's people out of the word of God they're not receiving the witness of God and it will be a condemnation unto them it's a savour of life unto life to some and a savour of death unto death to others because in their pride God's not keeping them back God's not stopping them from coming to him it's their own will they will not to come they refuse to believe and trust in the Lord of glory that we set before them. And so were we all in that state. But God had mercy upon us. And he reached down for us. and He quickened us and made us alive unto him. It is God that makes us to differ, my friends. How, do we have anything truly that's not been given, given unto us? God, he said, there again, verse 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? What do you have that you haven't received? Did you choose to be born physically into this world? No, you didn't. Each and every one of us, my friends, received life from our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, all the way back to Adam and Eve. And they received it of God. That life, which God breathed into Adam, which he then took ribs from him and created Eve, that life which goes from Adam to Eve and then from them too down to all of us is from God. Our physical life we have received of God. God's made the, the all that exists. But of all the living animals in the world, of all that exists out here in nature, nothing is said to be a living soul but man. Man became a living soul. And my friends, that soul will not die. It will not cease to exist. It will go on after this physical life is over. And it goes to a place of waiting. Some go to a place of waiting for eternal damnation because in their lifetime they received all the pleasures and joys and goodness of this life and they refused to acknowledge God for it. They refused to believe upon Him. And they died in their sins. They had the opportunity. They won't be able to say, God, I never knew about you. I didn't know you were there. What do you mean, God? No, they won't be able to say that. But when they stand before that holy and righteous God, they'll have to honor, yes, God, you gave me life. You gave me all the good things in my life. You gave me my ups and downs. You chastened me. You rebuked me. You set trials into my life. And I didn't want to believe on you. They'll be honest in that day, and they'll just say, yeah, I refuse to receive it. I refuse to believe it. And now I receive my just reward of condemnation. Because I live my life in sin. I refuse to turn from my ways and believe upon you and serve you, O oh God. There's none that will justify themselves in that day. And you won't be there, my friend, if you're still lost and done your sins and you die in that state. You won't be able to justify yourself before God. But you'll stand there in humble acknowledgement that God is righteous to judge you for everything you did in your life. And you would not turn from your way to the true and living God and acknowledge Him as Lord of your life. None will be able to justify themselves before God. And it's God that made us to differ. It's God that gave us the physical life and it's God that gave us the spiritual life. He could have left us there, lost and undone in our sins, in a state of refusing to come to Him, loving the darkness, loving the sinful life, even though there's a light shining over there, we refuse to go over there and be a part of it. Oh, it reproves us, it rebukes us, it chastens us. Oh, we're running from it. We don't want to be a part of that. Oh, it's foolishness, there's Christians over there. Oh, there's a God. They mock at God. They laugh at God. Oh, where is God? Oh, they don't see Him. And you die in your sins. 
that that light of God shined upon us and we tried to run here and tried to run there. We couldn't get away from it. It's God that made us to differ. It's God that reproved and rebuked us. It chastened us. He, as a beloved child, He chastens us. And He would not let us go because He loved us. Oh, and some want to get all bent out of shape. Oh, if God didn't have that same love for everyone. They can't accept it. Well, you go right on thinking that, believing that. Next thing you know, you'll find yourself in, there at the judgment seat of God, and then you'll be acknowledging, yeah, God made me to differ. God made us to differ. We didn't do it ourselves. Some of you out there who believe, say you believe upon the Lord, but yet you're hanging on to some pride, believing that you made yourself to step that last step into His grace. That you had some say at the last moment. If God had left you to yourself, you'd have never come to Him. God didn't leave you to yourself. He made you to differ. God is the one who revealed himself unto us. And once we saw and really understood then the difference, none wants to go back. None who has been redeemed and saved by the grace of God wants to truly go back unto that condemnation and to fall away from the grace of God and be forever condemned and go to hell. No one wants to do that. My friends, it's God who makes us to differ. He gives us all the good things we have in this life. He allows the bad things to come upon us in this life. He allows hardships to come upon us in this life that we not let ourselves become dependent upon the things of this world and think that it's all of our it's of ourselves and what we're doing. But it's of God who leadeth us, who saves us, and continues to provide for us. And we look to God for all we have need of. Oh, I'm striving to work and get my years in, so I got that pension lined up. And I, I'm depending upon what I'm able to do to get that pension, grab hold of it. Now I'll be set for life. Oh, many have got it, got hold of it, and then they died. Never able to take good advantage of it. Don't think you've got a set number of days or years. Today may be your last day. I encourage you to look to the Lord if you don't know Him and free pardon and forgiveness of sin. Don't turn from these things. But look to the Lord and cry to Him and say, Lord, I don't understand these things. I don't know truly whether you're there or not. But I pray that you should have mercy upon me. And if you can truly, sincerely crawl out unto Him and pray for Him to have mercy upon you and give you the gift of faith and repentance, He will. He'll give you the ability to see and believe on Him and whom you have heard by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. This is the plan and purpose of God, that we should preach unto you the things of God that you might hear and then be able to believe and then be able to call out upon him, or call unto him, that then he can save you. And he will. He'll not leave you in your sins. He'll save you from them, that you might live then for him. My friends, Sadly, again, we're out of time. Every day brings us closer to the end of the days that we have. Don't put it off. Repent and believe. Serve the Lord while you can.